This is a true story, photographed above the Arctic Circle where it actually occurred. Through the cooperation of the Thompson Institute for Arctic Research and various territorial authorities, it has been possible to recreate these events exactly as they happened. As director of the Thompson Institute here in Alaska, I have witnessed many stories of courage and heroism. The frozen Arctic demands that a man be a hero. He must fight wind, blinding snow, temperatures scores of degrees below zero, isolation, and disease. But the struggle of Thomas Barlow, M.D., against overwhelming odds is one of the strangest and most dramatic stories ever to come out of the far north. I first met Barlow during the war when he was a naval medical officer stationed here in Sitka. Even then, what he had seen of our country, her vastness, her majesty, and her need for medical care, convinced him that this was the place where a doctor could best serve humanity. After the war, he returned with his wife and young daughter. They settled in a distant outpost called, appropriately enough, Cape Fear. First, Barlow established a dispensary. Gradually, patients learned to come there for medical aid. Those who could not reach the Cape, Barlow visited using a converted military amphibian plane which he had been able to purchase. But in spite of his energy and determination, there were still places in that icy vastness beyond his reach. On the eastern slope of the Brooks Mountains in January of last year, a plague of unknown origin struck a wandering tribe of Eskimos. Unable to ward off the disease, the tribe struggles toward the nearest white settlement, Nunak, on the Colville River. For centuries, primitive peoples like these have lived simple and contented lives in the icy Northland. They have eaten the raw fish of the frozen waters, dressed in the thick skins of the beasts who share their barren homeland, found comfort in igloos heated by blubber of the Arctic whales, but the coming of the white man has introduced new fears, new weapons, new masters, and new diseases. Lacking immunity to what we consider ordinary illnesses, whole tribes are wiped out by measles, influenza, or mysterious plagues like the one that now drives these weary natives toward the doubtful aid of civilization. Their route is a mass of breaking ice, hemmed in by shimmering mountains of snow and frozen waterways. Desperate men on a desperate journey trudging through the 20-hour long winter night. There is no time for sleep or rest. Food is forgotten. Death drives them mercilessly on. Walking, swimming, crawling, pulling their half-exhausted dogs across the treacherous ice floes, the little band moves tediously ahead. If they become too ill to continue the journey, they must be left behind. Ceremonial tradition prescribes a living funeral, and the corpse can make no protest. He must conceal his fears, his doubts, and his weaknesses as friends lead him to a frozen tomb. Into this white coffin the sick man is placed, still breathing, still alive. He is given only enough food to last his few remaining hours. His weapons are placed at his side. And then the feeble light of the long Arctic night is shut off forever as the last block of ice is firmly set into place. But still the tribe must move forward. The temperature falls 40 degrees below zero, 50, 60. Sheets of ice and snow slash at unprotected faces, and the drops of blood that spurt forth are frozen as they touch the air. The wind shifts, and the blizzard strikes with renewed fury. Even now, in the face of an enraged nature, the sleds inch piteously ahead. But the storm forms an almost impenetrable wall. Eyes cannot peer into the darkness. Bodies can no longer move against the wind. And at last, the tribe's chieftain signals that it is impossible to continue. As well trained by instinct as the modern soldier is by discipline, each man takes his place. His frozen fingers dip into the snow, and mechanically, automatically, the igloos are constructed. The enforced wait gives the chief an opportunity to inspect the progress of the plague. Intuitive observation takes the place of skilled diagnosis. The first traces of the disease are easily seen. Brightly flushed cheeks, cracked lips, and burning eyes. The old, the young, even the very young can be victims of the dread contagion. The chief's decision is final, irrevocable. He alone holds the power of life and death. 
This mother has risked infection herself rather than reveal that one of her twins is stricken. But the dying child is wrenched from her breast and only her eyes can protest. A small square of bearskin provides a tiny shroud. The emaciated figure sprawls awkwardly on the fur. The ends are folded across his drawn features and a weak cry of pain is gradually stifled beneath the thick pelt. The men push aside the heavy sheet of ice that blocks the entrance to the igloo. The funeral procession is without ceremony. Even prayers could not be heard above the storm. The frail bundle is carried through the blizzard. Snow huts have already been prepared, and the child is placed inside an igloo of death. Silently, with hidden grief, the men complete their tragic task and return to their places in the council. Only the howling wind is left to mourn, for tribal law demands that not even a mother shall weep. The storm weakens. The sledges are again loaded and the tribe crawls over the fresh fallen snow, resuming the painful journey. Two months later, Dr. Thomas Barlow is returning from a routine round of distant patients. This trip has kept him away from home for nearly 10 days, and now only one case remains, a sick trapper at Ice Cape. Meanwhile, during these past weeks, the plague has spread. The few Eskimos who finally reached Nunak have infected the village. A dog team races to find the only doctor within a thousand miles. Huskies no go much longer. Look, Kuya. There's the doctor's plane now. Ah, uh -huh. that's him. Ready to land at Ice Cape. Hurry, Kuya. Hey, uh. hey, hey, smash! Smash! Wandering Eskimos brought it in. A plague? What kind of a plague? Don't know. Came kind of sudden like. Wiped out half of Nunak already. Nunak? Well, that's 400 miles over the Andacott Range. But my plane is in no condition to take that long a hop. I'll have to go back with you, my dog team. Dog team take too long. Besides, those dogs couldn't mush another mile. They're plumb wore out. Everybody in Nunak, die. If you no come. All right, I'll go. Get word to my wife. She'll understand. You make my people well. Think you can make it, Doc? I can if my motor holds out. Want me to go along? No, thanks. I believe I can find my way. There's no use overloading my ship. I'll follow the Arctic Ocean to the islands then head up the Colville River to Nunak. turn back to the little settlement where he lives. 
For a moment, he remembers that this is a special day, his daughter's birthday, and flies onward. At Cape Fear, his wife and little daughter impatiently await his arrival. Daddy! Daddy! Hey, anybody home? Oh, it's only Uncle Jim. Of course, Jim. Come on in. Say, Martha, you look as lovely as a picture. <laughs> it's a new dress. Well, whatever it is, I like it. Oh, come, come, young lady. Don't I guess it'll low to this evening? I guess so. Hello, Uncle Jim. There, that's more like it. Now, here's something for you and a very happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Say, this looks like some party. Well, it will be if Tom gets here before the roast is burned. I'm afraid I, I have some unpleasant news, Martha. Well, what is it? Tom sent a message from Ice Cape. A plague has broken out in Nunak. Some wandering Eskimos carried the infection in. Tom has gone up there, but, but he said you'd understand. Nunak? What? Quite a distance. Well, I... Oh, boy! Thank you, Uncle Jim. Thank you. It's a lovely present, Mo. Take good care of it. Well, Jim, you might as well stay to dinner. Aren't we going to wait for Daddy? Well, no, Emily. Your father isn't coming home tonight. He has to take care of some sick people. But it just won't seem like a birthday without Daddy. Well, perhaps Uncle Jim will substitute. It's a good dinner and a darn good cake, if I do say so myself. I help Mommy with the baking. Well, you know my appetite. All right, ladies, you've talked me into it. <laughs> oh, boy, look at that cake, Emily. Come on, let's sit down, huh? Here we go, Emily. 300 miles away, Barlow is flying at an altitude of 200 feet above the Arctic Ocean near the mouth of the Colville River. Below him stretches one of the most awe-inspiring regions of the Earth's surface. The last sign of human habitation, a trapper's hut, is more than 100 miles behind him. And Nunak is the same distance ahead. Between these two outposts of civilization, lie only icebergs, glaciers, and frozen tundra. A tailwind is pushing him steadily along. He expects to be in Nunak before dark. So far, the journey has been uneventful, routine. But at 5.15 p.m., 98 miles north, northeast of Nunak, as the nose of the plane turns landward, fate interrupts Dr. Barlow's desperate journey. Shaken, tired, cold, and wet, he climbs from the water onto the first solid thing he can grasp. He forces himself to a higher position to escape the danger of the freezing water. While nearby, a school of whales has been driven to the surface by the pressure underwater. They rise to the surface because they too know that the crashing snow and ice bring danger. But these are their home waters, and they know how to take care of themselves. Knowing he cannot be burdened with heavy, wet clothing, he discards the heaviest. Seeing dry land in the distance, he knows he must reach it if he is going to survive. He starts out across the jagged, broken ice, following the only possible way across. He knows that he can do it if there are not too many obstacles in his way. But there are obstacles of a kind he knows he should have expected.
an obstacle that lives only from day to day, that asks no quarter and gives no quarter in a fight, an obstacle that would as soon kill a man as it would kill a fish, an obstacle that would as soon tear apart a man as it would tear apart a small seal, an obstacle that lives to eat. This is the land of the survival of the fittest. Barlow must reach land, but first, he must somehow maneuver and escape this danger. Here, in the frozen wastes, the slightest noise is heard. The breeze carrying every strange scent, sharp eyes catching every flicker of movement. Barlow is quickly discovered and knows that he must act fast. He has only one course to follow, and he takes it. With his heart beating out a prayer of thanks, Barlow climbs to safety. And with another prayer on his lips, he sees that he has reached the gateway to dry land. The trails of reindeer and moose, he knows, lead across no snow and ice. But their trails do not lead in his direction. His way leads across mountains. Dogged and determined, he continues onward. Where the sure-footed mountain goat climbs, he must climb, up the steep sides and over the ridges. But as much as he wants to go on, Barlow knows that weariness and shock and dampness will force him to seek a place to rest. While climbing, he looks for possible shelter. More than rest, Barlow needs warmth. As a doctor, he knows that dampness and fatigue lead to pneumonia. Hoping his flint will give off the very necessary spark, he prepares to take care of his first need, warmth. He has it, but he is unaware that the owner of the cave is nearby. Not even a smoke. Well, maybe they'll dry. A notebook, a pencil, three cigarettes, a lighter, a knife. These are the only weapons of Dr. Thomas Barlow lost in a desert of ice. These and the will to live. And there are more dwellers of the cave. But these, though they might not prefer human company, are more friendly and more playful than the owner. Shoo! Go on, beat it.
may be your home, but you boys have a roommate tonight. Clear out. I've had enough bears for one day. Oh, well. Come on back. Barlow now has the warmth and the shelter, but before he can continue, he needs rest and relaxation. But always is the haunting memory of the oath he took as a doctor, and the realization that there is a settlement of human beings dependent on his reaching them. But the mother of the little cubs has no intention of losing a fight so easily. Six days later, he is still walking, taking direction from the stars and the sun, moving southward, he follows a map that he only vaguely remembers. He is kept alive by eating the roots and grasses and the few small animals he can trap with his bare hands. Tracks in the snow are easily followed by anyone, and the scent of a man and two little cubs are very easily followed by an angry mother. Don't run away. Nobody's going to hurt you. Scared the white fox away. Go on, you little beggars. Hey, let go. There's only enough for me. You fellows can eat roots. Go on, get away from here. Go on. I know you're hungry, but so am I. That's all you get. and quit following me. Get back to your old lady. She's been trailing me for days, and I don't want to tangle with her again. The scent is still strong. The camp has not long been evacuated. Here are all the telltale signs and odors that show the human and the two cubs are still traveling in company. This is a scent not to be lost. Doggedly, Barlow trudges on with one idea in mind, to find a way to reach those who need him. Barlow believes he has lost the bear, but to make sure, he crosses a river, hoping to lose his scent and shake off the determined mother who has been following him. Boys, there's an otter. Another meal gone. I suppose we'll have to draw up our belts another notch. As he plods along, the need of food is becoming strong. Suddenly, he sees salmon. Salmon! Thank you. 
some things even small animals can do that men cannot. Too tired and too hungry to realize this, Barlow gives up his attempt at fishing. Here was a chance to get food, enough to keep him going for some days, and the food slipped through his fingers. Wait a minute. We'll make a fire, boys, and cook this. There, go on. You'll get your share. Go away. Wait till I cook it. Look at those ermine go after that. Hey, come back with that fish. Come here. Come on, let go. And you stay away from here until this is cooked. I guess I'll have to adopt you two boys. But you ought to be with your mother. Like those two fawns over there. She must have lost my trail at that last stream. So I guess you're stuck with me. Fifteenth day. Smoked salmon should last out the week. Cubs still with me. I've named them Tom and Jerry and am making pets out of them. Resting for a while, Barlow keeps up his diary. If he does not survive, he knows that this will someday tell his story. But again, there is danger. Musk oxen, the buffalo of the north, the most dangerous animal of the Arctic. Fearing he has disturbed them, Barlow immediately looks about for an escape. But hemmed in on all sides, he discovers he has no choice but to summon his strength and to make a break. He runs as fast as his weary legs will carry him to the nearest point of refuge, a small tree. command of its leader surrounds the tree and only awaits the signal to charge and grind this strange creature under their pointed hoofs. But another scent has reached their nostrils, a dangerous scent, one they recognize as an enemy, one that tells them the young they have left behind are exposed and unprotected. Playful and unseen, these two infants are unaware of the effect they are creating among the oxen. are some use. You scared those musk oxen away and saved my life. Just the same, I'm going to gather some of this grass and make a rope for you. What's that? Somebody's cutting timber. Hello. Just some beavers working.
An eagle in the sky, looking for a possible kill, sees something below and descends to look around. There is a meal here, if he can get his claws on it. A meal that is too curious and too willing to play. But the eagle is in no mood for playing, and Jerry suddenly discovers that this is not a game, that this is serious business. enough to carry you off. This will teach you to behave. If you're going to travel with me, you have to have manners. Yes, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. There. This will keep you from stealing any more of our smoked salmon. There's little enough now, and we may have a long way to go. Let's be going. You may not like this road, but you'll get used to it. For days, Barlow has been following the endless windings of the Colville River. But now he decides to ford the icy waters and strike out overland on what he hopes is a shorter route to Nunak and to civilization. It's been three weeks, Jim. There should be some word. Maybe it's a serious plague. He's probably working day and night. Oh, I, I'll get it. It may be. Yes? Is Jim Thompson here, Mrs. Barlow? Oh, why, yes, of course. Come in. They told me I might find him here. Well, hello, Jim. Hello, Mac. What's the trouble? Uh, don't know exactly. A party just got in from Nunak. Is anything wrong? Half the people there are dead and no sign of the doctor. Tom. No, Mrs. Barlow, don't be alarmed. I have some natives out looking for them, and Jim here will organize some searching parties. If he got past the Colville River, the climate's better. He'd have a chance. He may have been forced down somewhere. It's more than likely. If you can get a plane, Jim, I'll go along and keep my eyes open. Sure, Mac. We'll get right at it. Now, don't worry, Martha. Wherever he is, we'll find him. <laughs> Me find them seal bay. Plenty more in water. Uh -huh. Might be from that young doctor's plane. I've got a while to look out for him. He's been missing now for three weeks. He might have gone down in one of them there parachutes. Did you scout around for him, Injun? Look around all beach. No see white man. Me go spirit land. Me come here. If he crashed in the ice, he hasn't got a chance. I'll send news to the outside. Friends, there is a possibility that Dr. Barlow still lives. By radio, men are notified. By newspaper, the public is informed. From Sitka and Juneau, from mountain and valley, from river and ocean, men are called to aid in the search, to watch for signs, to send word about clues. All good men from all corners of Alaska and the Yukon join the search. Eskimos recalling the kindness, the skill, and the patience of the Arctic doctor join the search. By plane, on foot, and in kayak, they set out to do a job they know has to be done. If there is even a faint possibility, they will find their man, not only for the sake of his family, but for their own sake. Barlow has been missing for 42 days. Sometimes his path has taken him in a direct line toward his destination. 
At others, he has wandered in great circles or been lost down blind canyons. His sense of direction is no longer certain. Wait, I left my knife back at the river. I'll tie you fellas here and keep you out of mischief when I go back and get it. No one likes to be tied up, but there are times when little bears with too much curiosity should be, especially when they are filled with a playfulness and have no knowledge of danger or of the strangeness of the Arctic, where in the midst of frozen wastelands suddenly appear areas that are tropical in their heat and that have hot, bubbling springs. The origin of these springs is one of the great wonders of the Northland, and it is no place for two little cubs to play. Curiosity could boil a little bear. trying to do, get a singe? Here, come here. If there's any trouble around, you're sure to find it. We'll go in the warm water below this spring and take a bath. If it's a bath you want. Here we are. Now you wait here till I get back. Jerry, come down and let those swallows alone. Come on down here and watch behind your ears. Look out, you're gonna fall. There, didn't I tell you? Hour after hour in the Arctic daylight, Barlow travels onward, resting more and more often, making shorter and shorter notes in his diary. Here, here, Tom, Jerry. Hey, cut it out. Hey, here I am! Hey, down here! Hey! miniature man thousands of feet below can easily be overlooked in the vastness of the Arctic. Another negative report is filed. No sign of Thomas Barlow. The results pour in from the dog sled, the kayaks, the planes. No sign. Thomas Barlow is still missing. They didn't 
see us, did they? Now a new loneliness grips him. The momentary nearness of other human beings emphasizes the emptiness and desolation of this trailless wilderness. And he thinks of home and those he loves. Haven't seen a living soul. I am coming in. Many days later, Barlow is still trudging on. He has been living on game, which has become more scarce with each step he takes. Strangely enough, hundreds of rabbits appear, possibly by fate, across Barlow's path. Look, boys. Snowshoe rabbits. We eat. Come on, let's catch one. Now, let's drive him this way. Snowshoe is right. Your foot is big as my hand. More and more often, the strong-willed doctor finds it necessary to rest. But not one of his little companions. It is spring, and a young man's fancy turns to fun. Jerry has again found a playmate of a different kind, but more his own size. Ah, oh, come on, just one little kiss. It won't hurt. Honest. What does she want, caveman stuff? For an amateur, his technique isn't too bad. Maybe she's an old-fashioned girl, doesn't believe in smooching on her first date. But how long can a lady resist? You know, a girl this young usually has a chaperone around somewhere. up the 
jagged cliff, hunting for a cave in which to spend another restless night. He tries to tell himself that tomorrow he will reach Nunak. But so many days have passed, and so many endless miles are behind him that he begins to despair. Climbing and hunting have taken their toll on his energy, and only Barlow's strong will pushes him toward his destination. Authorities at Point Barrow announced that all hope of finding Thomas Barlow, the flying doctor, has been abandoned. All areas have now been covered. All searching parties have now returned, and Thomas Barlow has been given up for dead. Emily? Yes? Come out here, Mama, dear. I'm going out. Be a good girl. I won't be long. Mommy, have they found Daddy? No, not yet. But they will. But they can't give up now. Those planes have probably flown over Tom a hundred times. Can't they just try once more? I've already talked to them, Martha. It's no use. As far as the authorities are concerned, the search is over. But it isn't. But Martha, it's been three months. We might just as well face facts. It's Tom. But Matt, where? What? An Eskimo brought it in. He found it on a land shelf of the Colville River. But it isn't burned or damaged. That means Tom's alive. Or at least that he was alive when he took it off. He probably kept on for Nunak. If he got south of the mountains, he could have made it on foot. Now, Martha, there are a lot of people in Nunak. If Tom were there, we would have heard something. But there was an epidemic. Maybe the people were too sick. Maybe he got on through to Nunak at that. Mac, you'll go. You'll look for him. Well, I'll, uh... It isn't just for me, Matt. The people here need Tom. You're right, Mrs. Barlow. We all owe a lot to the doc. I'll go to Nunak and look around. How about a plane, Jim? Sure, Mac. I can get you a ride as far as Remington. From there on, you'll have to go up the river by boat. I'll make it all right. I just hope we're not too late. In the last several days, Barlow has been able to cover only four and a half miles. His will and his hope are all he has now to rely on, and only these keep him going. Porcupines again for breakfast, boys. And once again, his thoughtless friends use their curiosity and their playfulness to make trouble. But this is much worse than anything they have done so far. Steak, but you porcupines will do. Before man is ever aware of danger, the animals know of it. And to them, fire in the forest is the worst catastrophe that could happen. Worse than flood or famine is fire. It knows no set direction. It follows no rule. It travels fast and spares no one, neither man nor beast nor plant. It consumes all in its path satisfying only its destructive hunger. Tom! Jerry! ice or water can save them, the porcupines scramble onto the ice. The great glacier and island of ice and snow making its own eternal winter is a refuge for man and animals alike. For them, there is only one thought, self-preservation. In their sense of survival, they show the way to safety. I'm going to tie you fire bugs up again once and for all. Come on, let's get out of these mountains. With sinking spirits, Barlow realizes that he is now practically alone in a land of desolation. 
Almost too weak to write more. No food for three days. Can't go on unless I kill one of the cubs. Now, after more than three grueling months of exposure and hunger, Thomas Barlow's tired body tells him it is time to surrender. But though he has no idea of where he is going, his footsteps lead him on, perhaps to his destination, perhaps to his death. Here is the point where a man's training comes into use. Neither his will nor his body are under control. Now there is only his instinct, bred by years of study and years of hardy discipline. Only these keep him moving in his dazed condition. Only these numb the despair of his spirit. And only these are his salvation. Slunak! Hello! Where are you? Hello! Where are you? Hello, where are you? We can't stop the plague. The Eskimos that brought it in have nearly all died out. Those well enough are moving out by boat. Great swarms of ants are taking care of the dead. We must leave the dogs behind. There isn't enough food for them, and they're already half mad with hunger. I will be the last to depart. Oh, my God. 
Fellows have been traveling with me ever since I crashed. If it hadn't been for them, I don't know if I'd been able to keep going. Thanks, boys, for sticking with me. In time, Barlow has recovered, and his story has become a testament to human endurance and ingenuity. To the Eskimos, it has become a legend told at campfires scattered over a thousand frozen miles. And the man himself is considered almost a god as he flies his rickety plane into the pale midnight sun, bringing the wonders of modern medicine to the outermost edges of the earth. They look up to the sky in wonder and enjoy as he passes. For Dr. Thomas Barlow has met the fury of the Arctic and conquered it. Of such is the spirit and the dignity of man.